Join us on the Plyad Burning Man 2014 for my talk in David Bronner's Foam Dome, hosted by Alan Bediner for the Anandapod Speaker Series. On arrival, I got a full body wash, donned my closest thing to a Greek tunic, stepped out onto the green floor all moist and radiant, and was greeted by the brightly lit souls of the assembled burners. This scene was not unlike the temple at Eleusis which is what this talk is all about. In fact, Burning Man itself was not unlike the ancient Greek Eleusinian mysteries themselves. So journey with Dr. Bruce back to a time when visionary initiation was the norm and helped create what we might call civilization. Or at least we could call it that if we can recover it from the end game of the uninitiated juvenile usurpers. So, have you had a wonderful time here on the playa so far? Oh, yeah. How many of you endured a 30-hour wait to get in? Then you deserve extra special magic. Yeah. So, Playa Murphy is leaving you alone. All of us people that came in early and had it easy, and we had 24 hours where there were no vehicles coming in. It was amazing. It was like the Burning Man was in stasis for 24 hours. It was stopped. And we were all wandering around like, what's going on? We're in a time warp. We're in a 24-hour hold like NASA has for launches. And people were in a love energy you can't believe because we realized we're the only ones here. There's no law enforcement, no porta potty cleaning, no nothing. It's just us. <laughs> and it felt like Burning Man in like 1999, except 20 times the size, you know, 18,000 people on site. It was really weird. It was really unique. So thank you for permitting us to have <laughs> oh my god you went to a casino yeah what's interesting about all that is uh that's the virtual world that the money machine wants to create for your reality you come out here and see this is the virtual world we want to create and it's a really an interesting contrast to go and see what the machine has made and see how bad it is right and once you realize it's bad and you, then you don't put any energy into it don't don't feed those slot machines you know anymore you don't have to feed another machine and the other machine we're conceiving of right here right now so those slot machines can go away in the future but maybe for certain aunties and grandmas that just love to do it you know, we'll keep it but they can't put their money in they they get the cherries but they don't get broke <laughs> and uh by way of introduction, how many of you listen to the Levity Zone podcast, which this is going into, by the way? Uh, so, levityzone.org, there's a listener. Uh, it came out of the Psychedelic Salon podcast that uh, Lorenzo Haggerty runs. Psychedelic revolution! <laughs> Whoa! Revolution, revolution, revolution. Okay, let's do a hip hop version of this talk. <laughs> Me trying to do hip hop, that would be something, <laughs> I tell you. Terrence did overtoning. Did any of you see him do that the last two years of his life? It turns out he could do it. You know, this guy that was so kind of not yes. a performer. Yeah. Let's give a hand for Alan Bediner for putting this thing together. Let's give a hand to you for your patience and welcome to Anandapod Speaker Series at Foam Mirage. And Bruce, thank you. You're on. I'm on without further ado. Okay, let me, oh, that really is working. So I want to tell you a story that occurred to me in Peru last week. I was up in the Andes with Dennis McKenna, brother of Terence McKenna, a tremendous carrier honor of the tradition of the McKenna brothers. His path was ayahuasca. He works for the plant. If you ask him, what do you do? I said, I work for this plant. I'm a, an emissary for this plant. So scientific research and shamanic work. And one of the things he's doing is he's 
basing very powerful ayahuasca ceremony at the Wilcatica Resort in the Sacred Valley near Cusco. And I can't tell you what a beautiful place this is. It was created by Carol Kunis, a South African woman who came to this land 20 years ago. And on the land was this knobbly tree that looked very old. It turns out it's a Lukma tree planted by pre-Incan people on this land. And she built around this Lukma tree these fantastic gardens, chakra gardens, fantastic housing for seminarians, you know, a, a beautiful Peruvian staff all trained, mostly doing yoga and things like that. But now they've brought medicine work there with a fantastic shaman named Waira, who I've never seen anyone work a room like Waira can work a room. The, the power that this man has to shape the energy. And he does a healing for everyone in a 40-person session every night. You know, some shamans sort of parcel out their healing energy, but this guy has enough to basically go and pull your soul up, you know, put it on a coat hanger and get it dry cleaned every night. <laughs> so, uh, so check it out. And there's, there's going to be things coming out about Wilkatika. But one of the things that happened at Wilcatica, by day we're climbing up into Incan complexes and seeing and getting to know Quechua people. Quechua people are these guys and, and women that wear the most colorful stuff. I should have worn one of the hats. Uh, I'm wearing this Greek thing, you know, so you'll find out uh, why later. The Quechua people are basically Wookiees on the earth. You know, the Wookiees from Star Wars. <laughs> Their language was used as one of the basis for Lucas's Wookiee language. And they live at 5,000 meters and up. That's 18,000 feet. The Spaniards could never get to them. They couldn't Catholicize them. They couldn't monetize them. And so they're living in the happy, joy-filled, from-joy existence of children growing their potatoes. Their main meat source is guinea pigs. They domesticated guinea pigs. Can you imagine that? You know, they eat guinea pig. And making fantastic colorful garments out of alpaca and llama. But these people, are they have no currency. They have everything they need. They're a sliver of about a couple hundred thousand of humanity living in the old way. Living in the way before mind. Because as soon as they do the five, six hour walk down to the communities of the Sacred Valley, they encounter ATMs, truck drivers trying to make a sole, uh, the tourist trade, all that. But they happily go through and they're smiling and they happily come to you and do a coca ceremony, you know. But you realize that these are people from another planet. These are people who are not in the matrix. They're not in mind, they're in joy. You know, they're using mind, but they're not overusing it and they're not controlled by other things that you know, make a buck and stuff like that. The Quechua, the Quechua, there's only a few places in the earth where these humans still exist. Uh, but roll back the clock to, I'd say, about 1700 BC. And guess what was happening? What was happening was the beginnings of civilization in the Mediterranean, the coming to consciousness of humanity. We'd come out of Africa, we'd been through our ice ages and our genetic neck down and whatever else had happened. But suddenly, it was the Mediterranean, it was the Garden of Eden. There was Sumer, there was Chatul Hayuk, there was Egypt, it was all sort of coming up. And it wasn't necessarily a civilization all based on mind. There was a lot more heart, there was a lot more Quechua in these people. And what they did in the earliest religions, I mean, this is before all the Abrahamic religions and all that stuff happened, they created mystery schools because they came out of a tribal tradition. The tribal traditions all have initiation ceremonies for their youth because they've learned through painful prior experience. Unless you initiate youth, especially young men, you get trouble. You've got to kind of iron them flat, you know, and get them nice and crisp and Put them through a test. You have to. So as civilization burgeoned in Crete and places like that, they established mystery schools. These were kind of like Burning Man events to initiate the young. But then in Greece, a set of really rockin' ladies 
who were the ladies of the academy, basically, as Greek civilization was coming up, they said, we need to do this one better, and we know how. We're going to dig an enormous pit in the ground. You can still see this. You can go there. We're going to sink a building in there. They probably did it kind of on the playa for a while and temporarily, and then they just said, we need to build a facility. They built this facility where a thousand people could get into this room, and then they put incredible fabrics and designs and lighting and sound and smoke and olfactory essence into this room. And the initiates were everyone. Everyone had to go there in their lives. Roman emperors went there. The highest of the high went there and the lowest of the low. So what they rolled out for civilization was you are not a human being unless you've been to Eleusis until you're an initiate. You've got to come. So for 1,700 years, this is what was going on. And the history of this was smashed to smithereens in the 5th century, and I'll tell you more about that later. But picture yourself. You're walking in a kind of outfit like this, probably not even this fancy. Everybody had to wear the same clothes, so they were not you know, uh, considered highbrow or lowbrow. They wanted to eliminate all that. And you walked through a village, and this special village, and it was probably the people making the psychedelic potion, would start catcalling you, saying, hey, you've got an ugly nose, and hey, you know, uh, you think you're so uh, tall and straight. Well, in 30 years, you're going to be a bent old man like me, so just get ready for, you know. And the whole goal of that was to knock everybody down to the same level, to turn them into as children. And as these people were walking toward the Eleusinian field, they went past this wheat, and on the wheat was purple little mushroom fungi growing. That was used to make the LSD analog kaikion drink, beverage, as Terence would call it, beverage, as though it's like just an ordinary like Coke or Pepsi or something. <laughs> So the uh, initiates went to the field, and they were there nine days. It's kind of like playa time, right? And they went through dance. They went through fasting. There was a required fasting diet to clean yourself out. And then on the eighth or ninth day, or whatever it turned out to be, they packed them into this performance space. And they probably had the, the oons, oons, oons like this. They had incredible music going. And the people drank the kaikion knocked it back and they went into a space and we don't know what was in this thing but we know it was so powerful Plato writes about this he writes about being connected with eternity sound familiar? and these people when they came out they were human beings they were human beings and they went to build the classical world the world of antiquity so Greek theater mathematics science, engineering, the organization of government, the polity, all this wondrous stuff, I posit, and of course the historians may knock me down, uh, but I posit that that was a psychedelic construction. That was a psychedelic construction. All the beauty of what civilization was. We demonize the Roman Empire and say, you know, what have the Romans done for us? And, you know, that we're living in Roman grids and that we're somehow Rome was bad, but I, I posit you it was beautiful. You know, maybe the slavery economy wasn't so, so hot, but it was a fantastic construction that came seemingly out of nowhere, just bam. Most of the provinces added opted in. They wanted citizenship. You know, occasionally there was the, uh, the odd invasion to run after, you know, nasty boys. So that's Rome. 410 AD or thereabouts, uh, Germanic tribes come in from the north, Rome is crumbling, and Christians described as a nasty bunch of, you know, uh, of fanatics by writers at the time, come in from the south and they smash the temple. And they replace this with an inferior culture that we're still in. An inferior culture. Think about that. Now, I have a lot of German friends, so I, I, I like German engineering too, but it was the idea of that barbarism that came in, the old tribalism which was about the bloodlust came in. But the Christians from the south, they were mental beings. They were, they were Pauline Christians. You know, they weren't the Gnostics. You know, they, they had already taken Jesus down a notch and knocked out Mary Magdalene and made people doubt Thomas and Judas, who was Jesus' equal. 
that Jesus had turn him in and do the whole deal it was pilloried. So then once the Jim Morrison was gone, they rewrote all the band's songs. So they smashed it. And we got monastic culture. We got all the stuff that, that we are living in still. They used the Roman model for control. But there was no initiation. The Roman emperors were initiated there. Augustus, a genius, Claudius, another genius of equanimity and organization, all went through Eleusis. You know? So Rome had a long run. It had some baddies and goodies. But that the key thing with Eleusis is work on yourself, on your own internal demons. So rolling the clock forward, what are we doing here? What are we doing at Burning Man? We're doing something like Eleusis. And according to the writer, uh, the Swedish writer who wrote the Psychedelia book that came out, there was a period in the Haight-Ashbury in the Bay Area from roughly around 66 through into 68. There was a period in which, as he writes, there was a chance for a second Eleusis to happen in the United States. And it never did. It fell on the, the pikes of you know, SDP and, and that terrible music festival where people died. I mean, it crashed and burned out. And there wasn't a spiritual leadership that moved up inside that. So it was a chance for an Eleusinian revolution. So what is happening now, starting with the work of Dennis McKenna in the 80s and into the 90s, what is happening? Little circles are forming. Well, how are they forming? They're forming around ayahuasca. They're forming around yoga. They're forming around breath work. They're forming everywhere. And we have uh, initiants, and we have practices, and we have, in some cases, medicines. Not all mystery schools use medicines. And the ayahuasca ceremony we had at Wilcatica, I was just stunned the the power of this thing. Unbelievable power. At one point, all of us were in the tryptamine dome, and everyone's mind was connected. It was like, oh my god, what is going on here? And I felt the madre, because I call her the madre ayahuasca, reach down and say, look at what I am doing. And I looked, and the people were all elevated. The people were there, and they were all gifting and giving and gifting and giving of their souls. And I said to myself, she's showing us we need to do a new form of community. We need to evolve community. Pull it up, pull it up. Because the trucks are roaring on the highway on the Lantetambo, and they're consuming the planet. And I went out and conferred with the tree, the Alukma tree. And I opened myself to the Alukma tree, and it was, wow! This Alukma tree became present. I saw the pre-inking people putting the seed in the ground. It was a magnificent thing that had gone through a thousand years from conquistadors to droughts and all this, and it was still there, preserved in the now in this retreat center. And I said, the power of this place, this is the new Eleusis. We are doing it right here, tonight, now. This is happening. And everyone who's coming into these ceremonies is being initiated, finally. Because we, we haven't had initiation. This is why we have psychopathic leadership. This is why we have juvenile kind of things. This is why we're victims of advertising and all this juvenility, because we haven't had our initiations. So this community is creating initiation. And you could be 90, you still need initiation. Or you can be the good age, like 15, 20, 21. You know, we're doing it. And we're doing it in a haphazard way, but it's happening because it's the recovery of our souls before mind, before the mind culture takes the planet down. So the new Eleusis is happening everywhere, in neighborhoods near you and in your neighborhood. It's happening in your heart as you do the work. But the world was fucking built on this foundation. Make no mistake about it. And we're recovering it. <laughs> anyway, so that's my talk. And uh, Alan, what is our timing? Do you want to just go rolling on to Ali, or do you want to do yeah, questions? Yeah, we can do a, 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 Allie and I can questions do, first. Um, what do you guys want to do? A couple questions? Yeah, two o'clock. Is that two? Oh, take two. Your time. Okay. Question? Really silly question. How do you spell Eleusis? <laughs> uh, E-L-E-U-S-I-S. Eleusis. Yeah. And you can, you can go there. Just go there and stand there and feel it. Amazing. And any other questions? Questions over here. Questions in front. Um, uh, the Madre, is that what you called her? Mm-hmm. Well, how do you connect with her every day? How do I connect with the Madre every day? Or that, in what do you do, like regularly? Yes, this is the trick. And I think that 
the Greeks, the Eleusinian masters that ran it, knew that they had to reboot those people hard uh, in a community to get them to bring that into daily life and build their civilization. And in fact, this is our challenge. I mean, you have these powerful tribs, but I find that, you know, it can be wiped out when you go home. Just within two, three days, the insights are gone and blah, 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 blah. And you literally have to sit in nature. You have to sit still every morning and calm the mind. The mind's the one that steals away the feelings and, and the, the access. And I do it through Sadarshan Kriya breath work. So I like do yoga. The breath work just turns my mind off in the morning so it doesn't run the day. Like I'm mindless for a while, even before my coffee. And suddenly, oh, stuff opens up in the morning. And I feel it's almost psychedelic. I do it every morning. The, the days that I miss it are days that are like grinding and bouncing along. The days that I do that practice, they're very driven by intuition and by feelings. So I, I think you have to do it and bring that into daily life. And You know, um, Rick Hansen's book, Buddha's Brain, where he talks about if you do this, you can rewire your neurons and you can train your mind into a Buddha's brain, into positive and open and giving to the world. You can do it. We have to rework the muscle. One more question. How much longer do you think these uh, civilizations are going to continue? I keep reading that uh, the government is trying to push them out and they're slowly making contact with these tribes in the Amazon. Do you think they're going to completely be eradicated or have a genocide or do you think they will remain? I think the, the question is about the tribes and the practitioners. I don't think anyone can stop this thing. But I think we can power it forward with more intention and realizing this is going to save our civilization and return us to Eleusis. We need to do it. No one's going to stop us because the model is crumbling and it's weak. You know, financial doo-doos that are going on are shaking apart the machine. It's being manipulated by psychopathic individuals that have no initiation and they have no empathy. They have no empathic response. They would have been nicely cleared out in an initiation ceremony, you know, so we shouldn't be letting them run us. It is nonsense that they're running this world. They're not even running it. I mean, as, as Terence McKenna said, no one is in control. You know, it's just a push and shove thing. It's like little children. There's no mind, there's no heart running it. But we are the new heart that's rising up. Every person in this room is part of the new world, but we need to own that and keep doing the work. We need to keep going and going and going. Um, one more, or should we? Uh... Yeah, one more. One more. So how do you see that happening in a, in a grounded, implemented way? It's a huge bolus of activity. How do we do this? This is the big project. I call it the great project of being. It's sort of my word for it. Um, by being here, by making eye contact and making love with people, more people who are looking at these phones. I told the Madre when I was in Peru, I said, Madre, let me show you the human world they're looking at these glowing boxes. If you're in this project to help us, they're looking at phones. They're training their children to look at phones primarily and not make eye contact. And they're giving them methamphetamines to drive them toward pixels and not persons. And so you have competition, Madre. You gotta fight harder. And she goes, whoa, the serpent has risen into technology. I say, yep, it's over to you. But uh, so every time you go into ceremony and you realize the eye contact is our power, the cuddle puddle is our healing. That's the way we evolved over 40 million years in the rainforest. We have to return to that. That's powerful enough to defeat all this stuff that's coming from outside. And the stuff that's coming from outside is what we made. You know, we could probably make better apps to make this, this work better. We made it, we can solve it. But it's unbelievably fast how this is rising. It's not just it all happened in the 60s and people got turned on. No, the 60s was a prequel. Well, I have Timothy Leary's library in my barn and I go through this quarter million news stories and I look at the explosion and the catastrophe of the 60s and the glory of it all. I realize that was, that was like the burst of explosion you'll see before the man goes. It was like the initial blast that said something is starting. This is the full on opening happening now the full burning, <laughs> burning of the oligarch, but uh, uh, it's happening now. So uh, I, I don't even know if I answered the question, but you did. thank you.
I, I want to thank you for your patience and a welcome, Ali, to the stage. Thank you, Dr. Bruce. I, mean, I saw his talk last year at Sacred Spaces, and he was talking about evolution and the dragonflies and how important it was to evolution. And literally, a dragonfly entered Sacred Spaces, flew around the crowd, flew on stage, and I, and I was talking to Dr. Bruce before this, and he said it followed him home. I kid you not. Like, it was magical. So you might now be asking, where and how can I pass through my own form of initiation, whether I'm 19 or 90? The answer is all around you, as the circles of a new Eleusis form in your neighborhood to offer healing, new community of brotherhood and sisterhood, and for some, visionary quests to the outer realms, challenging yet enlightening. Don't be fooled by the wolves of old religions in new sheep's garb by gurus guarding gateways to experience you should have directly, or by anyone peddling subscriptions. Seek direct transformation, not just therapy. When you enter the circle, look each of your co-seekers in the eye, and if it feels right, if the energy, the trust, and the power are there, then go for it. No work matters more at this critical time in the human enterprise. The book I mentioned but spaced out on the author is Patrick Lundborg's Psychedelia, a true gem of scholarship and speculation published in 2013. Sadly, Mr. Lundborg passed away in June of 2014, and his untimely death robbed the field of a true voice of the realms. I drew from his chapter on Eleusis, as well as from other books by such noted authors as Gordon Wasson, Albert Hoffman, and Carl Ruck. This episode's music includes two tracks, Nature's Spirit, used for the intro, and Felicity, used for the outro, by the artist Kyle Esfenshade. Jacob Amon did his usual sterling job on the cover art, giving yours truly a real feel of antiquity. So until next time, this is Dr. Bruce signing off, wishing you all magical journeys.